friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. It is Friday, October 13th, 2017. Haven't been able to do very much on the mandolin this week, mostly because I'm still waiting on parts. I ordered the peggy head overlay so I could finish up that neck, and it has not arrived even yet, and that's been a full week now. The uh, back is pretty much finished. I've spent quite a few more hours carving to the detail of the thicknesses. This thing is very light, very airy. For a piece of maple, you would think, wow, this, that's really light maple. Well, it's because I've spent a lot of time getting it real thin and real true. Uh, when you tap on it, it makes a lot of note and a lot of vibration. I can hear it a long time. Even the back, and so the backs aren't necessarily noted for having a lot of vibration because of being the harder wood, but this one does vibrate really well. I expect it to be a very woody sounding mandolin, a very good mandolin. I have spent uh, another hour or so just sanding it uh, with 220 uh, sandpaper and really trying to get all the little imperfections out of the outside of the back. Now, I never touch the inside with sandpaper. The traditionalists, uh, We'll even go further than that and say that they would never touch even the outside with sandpaper. They only use a scraper. But uh, i got to be perfectly honest with you. I'm not that good of a scraper. I'm good enough to leave the inside just scraped, but I'm not good enough to just leave the outside just scraped. Got a lightly damp cloth here. We'll go over it. This should make the grain really pop too. But uh, this will raise the grain and we can sand it some more. Take a look at the uh, grain there again. The camera's already, I can see the video uh, messing up with the uh, grain. But uh, and if you ever really want to humble yourself about what you think is a good smooth finish, in other words, you think you've done a great job, you think it's perfect and smooth and everything just looks wonderful, just take it outside in the very bright sunlight and you will quickly go, wow. Look at all those defects. The bright sunlight just shows up everything. And while it looks good in here, it really does, you can just see all kinds of little tiny defects in it when you take it outside. So I'm gonna go over it again. Well, this is 220 and we'll sand it with 220 and 400 again later when we put the binding on it. The next thing I'm going to do is carve the rose in the back here too, so that's another reason I want to sand it real good, because it's harder to sand once the rose is in there. This is what the back of the sandpaper looks like. It says sold only at Lowe's. Um, I'll tell you what, I swear by this stuff. It doesn't load up like other sandpapers do. I mentioned that this is very light. Curly red maple, it's very light now because it's been carved so delicately. And the actual weight is 6.1 ounces or 172 grams. I've had at least uh, two or three requests uh, from people and maybe more asking me to go into more detail on how I carved the rose in the back of the mandolin. So. I'm going to go into detail. Here we go. Okay, the first thing I do is I draw an imaginary line across this curve right here, and then I measure an inch down from that so that I get them all in the same place. I have my Rose uh, logo uh, in the computer, so I print it out, and um, what I do then is I uh, try to get the top of the Rose right on that one inch mark, and I get the stem of the rose right on the seam. Now that we've got her situated, we'll take our pencil and we'll trace the major outlines. I don't get into the detail, I just trace the outline of the leaves and the stem and all the petals. There's a lot of detail in this flower and I do try to carve the whole detail in there. People have asked me, well, how much would it cost to build one without the rows? And they don't come that way. <laughs> you can go buy those uh, at the store. You can't buy this one at the store. I don't feel like I charge extra for the rows. It just comes with it. I 
I think that'll do. So that's what we end up with. In video terms, it seems like mere seconds since I traced this design on the back. But in reality, it's been almost 24 hours. The uh, interruptions around here run pretty rampant. The moment I got this traced on here, the phone rang, and I had to go out in the field and rescue a red-tailed hawk that the dog was trying to kill. And what happened, I think, was that the red-tailed hawk swooped down, caught a copperhead snake, killed the snake, started eating the snake, but my guess is the snake bit the hawk. That's what I'm guessing. Because the hawk was, um, I don't know, lethargic and couldn't stand up good and was flopping around kind of like, couldn't fly. And the dog was trying to get a hold of him because of that. And we got the dog in time, fortunately. I don't think he damaged the, the hawk at all. But anyway, um, we put the hawk in a cage for, oh, about five or six hours yesterday. And by uh, before evening, uh, he looked like he was doing real good and could stand up and walk real well. So we turned him loose and he flew off. So success story. But that didn't help me get the uh, carving done here. So we're going to get started on that. The tools that I use for carving this... Pretty basic, uh, two X-Acto knives, and for the most part I use this one. And then I made this little hook blade with a chisel point on it, and what I use it for is I can pull in tight places, I get in and, and pull wood, and then I have this other little tiny, sharp, angled chisel. What I do first is I just simply trace the outline with the very sharp X-Acto knife, and I, and I put a brand new blade in each time when I do this. Sadly, if you're not careful, the tip of the blade will break off because this stuff is very hard. These tips are just needle tips on here. And uh, they break pretty easy, especially in this hard wood. The uh, other thing that I will use a lot, and I know someone already in a comment told me what this thing is called. It, you know, I appreciate that, don't get me wrong, but I don't remember what they told me now. My memory is about half an inch long at this point in my life so I don't remember what they called it it doesn't matter what they call it what I use it for is magnifying the design I get down here real close so it gives you a real good uh, look at what you're doing and I can get in here and carve detail with uh, with this and see the detail now, if I was carving, you know, your average size carving, I wouldn't need this kind of detail. But this is a very small carving, and there is a lot of fine detail I want to carve into it, like the veins of the leaves and different things like that. So this really does help. But first, we don't really need this. We're just going to trace around the drawing here. It just looks amazingly rough when you check it through this thing. I doubt the camera can pick this up, but let's give it a try. You can see how much bigger it looks. <laughs> it's amazingly huge through, the, through that thing. It's not focusing very well. There it is. But anyway, that give you an idea of what it looks like through that. Now we start some of the detail work. What I do is I carve away the wood that's coming up to that. Sometimes I use the X-Acto knife again. Other times I use the chisels. It just depends what's working at the moment. One of the things that I suppose if you were doing this for the first time especially, you would be taking, you know, a considerable risk uh, 
you know, hoping that it turns out that you don't spoil this whole top that you've spent hours carving. So I've done it many times. I feel pretty confident that it's going to be fine. Basically what I'm doing is just cutting like a wedge down to the line that I've already cut and so it's a deep kind of a wedge and then later I come back and I and I scrape off some of that high spot to fan it out kind of like you're feathering out drywall mud or tape you know taping a drywall joint type of thing but you just feather it out and that leaves the rows standing up tall having a little trouble with lighting because uh, I have to keep the light up here higher for the camera but uh, it doesn't help me getting down real close to the detail here One of the most important parts is when you're cutting into the flower, you got to be careful that you don't go too far because you'll lift up the flower and bust off something. If you do happen to bust something off, and I'm not going to tell you I've never done that, I have done it. Um, if you can find the part, you can glue it right back in place with the thin super glue and you'll never know it, but uh, you just got to be very careful. These little areas that are enclosed in here like this is a little triangle between the stem and the flower and it has to come out of there. Um, you want to make sure you've got them cut really good and you want to work towards the thickest thing you've got which in this case is the flower petal. If I work towards the stem I could break the stem right off. I have the outline of it carved out and yes it looks terribly rough that's just the way it is you know you have to make them look bad before they look better sometimes I think what I'm gonna do now is uh, I mean I, I could go ahead and do the detail next but I think instead I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, lower all this outside edge here and just try to smooth it out get it pretty clean and then I'll work on the detail of the flower see the slight difference here I've started this side here just very quickly and you can see the difference between this much rougher side so I just I just bevel some of this steep part right here off and then I just scrape it smooth. I'm just going to continue on around just knocking some of this high you know spots off and and smoothing it out. I'm not going to film that because it's kind of boring and we'll come back when we start putting the detail in. What I'm doing now is a detail cleanup. I'm using this little hook blade that uh, will um, pull, you know, I can use it to pull uh, loose fibers out and I'm getting down in between all the petals and things. I'm still on, you know, working on the back. I'm not actually working on the flower. I'm trying to smooth the back out around the flower. So <clears throat> you have to get down here and get really detailed. It looks horrible through this thing. It, it really looks rough. It looks terrible. So if you can make it look halfway decent through this magnifier, then it looks great to your eye. I've been working on it a while. I'm still not totally satisfied, but we're getting closer. And uh, what I think I'm going to do is just switch modes. Uh, sometimes you're better off to just, if you're not seeing the progress you want, like getting this real smooth around here, well then you're better off to just do something else or, or just, you know, give it a break for a while. I think I'll be okay if I just go ahead and move to cutting some of the detail in the leaves and the petals. So that's what I'm going to do next. 
What you have to think of here is shadows and which pedals are in front and things like that so that it looks realistic when you carve it. So I'm cutting, undercutting the ones that should be behind, leaving the ones out that are in front standing up taller. I think that's about all I'm going to do for right now. I'm going to take a little break and then come back and put the leaf detail in. That's where we're at right now. The, uh, I think you can see the petal detail is carved in there pretty well. It doesn't look very good in the video, but it, it looks pretty carved in there uh, to your eye here. I see one spot that's missing a spot. I think that looks a little better already, but it still just needs work. It, takes, it just takes time to make it real nice. It's been a couple days. I've given this a little bit of a rest, and uh, looking at it now, it's looking pretty good on a second look. A lot of times when you look at them after you've given it a rest, you think, oh no, it just doesn't look that good. But this looks actually pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. So now we're going to go and try to put the detail detail in here. And I don't draw the detail in first, I just carve it. And uh, I make a line down through the center for the, uh, for the vein, for the main vein like that. And then I just make little, and just make little tiny V cuts on all of them. And then I just make another little V cut off of the vein. We'll try to zoom you in here and let you see if you can see what I'm doing. That's about as close as the zoom is going to let me zoom. These uh, little lines, these, I try to cut them pretty small. The dye will go down in there and they'll be darker than the rest. So you'll kind of see them anyway, even if there's not much of a cut there. I try not to make the lines real straight. I try to curve them all a little bit. Uh, they just look more natural that way. If you just make real straight lines, it looks like stick figures. And then where the branch where the branch and the leaf touch, I just take and try to cut that as a little tiny line so that, again, the dye will find its way in there and give a little separation there. And then where one leaf goes behind the other, it's just like up here. You try to uh, shadow that by cutting that back below the surface so it looks like it's further behind. These little tiny leaves are very difficult to do without splitting or cracking the wood. You have to lighten your touch up a little bit sometimes, go over it a couple of extra times maybe. And I try to put the detail in those little leaves just like I put it in the bigger leaves. I will go over it with the magnifier and see if there's anything I can imp improve. And there always is. I'm going to go ahead and try to dye this rose. Uh, I don't always do that until I'm ready for staining, but uh, I thought I'd go, go ahead and do it partly for the video and maybe to just see if I see any defects or anything. So when you get to the edge, you really want to have your brush fairly dry when you get out to the edge so that it just doesn't take off and run everywhere. Well, the camera turned off on me somehow or another, but uh, you can kind of see there uh, roughly what we're dealing with in terms of the rows. You know, it looks a little weird uh, on the white wood, 
when you get the other uh, colors in there, it just kind of blends in and looks like it belongs there. But uh, right now it stands out <laughs> kind of like a sore thumb because it's on that white wood. We've got her thinned down to about 80 thousandths and that ought to be pretty good. Thought I'd try a different uh, angle for the camera and put you behind the bandsaw for a change. And I'm going to saw out this peg head. We've got it penciled on here. You might be able to see that. And uh, anyway, here we go. ahead of myself a little bit. I should have drilled this hole already, so I'm going to go drill this hole before I cut this line. We have the drill press set up and we'll drill this hole. The idea is to drill the hole so that it lines up with the back edge of the hole is tangent with this line. So anyway, that's what we did. We drilled a 5 16 inch hole that gives you a uh, a good enough size hole to, to bend your binding around and get it in there. I'm going to take it over to the little bandsaw with the little blade and finish this last little bit of cut. Uh, can, I tried to leave the pencil mark just barely showing everywhere where I can do some sanding now. One of the things that's, uh, you know, you could easily forget to do this would be to th thin this back down. I, I've left it thick on purpose. I'm going to take it down to about 600 thousandths. Uh, I've measured the Waverly tuning keys and that looks like that would work real well with them. And uh, I've got this preset approximately where it needs to go. We'll turn on the vacuum and get started. That's right on the money, 600 thousandths right to the thousandth, <laughs> so that's real good. That'll work just fine. I'll, you know, it, I can always go a little thinner if I need to. It's, uh, I like to leave them as thick as I can, can leave them. Um, a little heavier peg head gives you a little more sustain on your instrument. So I don't want it, I definitely don't want it too thick, that's for sure. But, uh, but, you know, I want it uh, where the tuning keys will stick through correctly with the ferrules and everything, and they'll look good. But, uh, it, you know, the thicker you can leave it, the better. I worked on this neck, uh, mostly the heel block and straightening from here to here and here to here, just to get it straight, symmetrical. You know, I worked on that off camera a little bit. Now I'm, I've talked to the customer and he's good with uh, shaping the neck like the lower shape. So that's where we're headed. It's the lower shape on the uh, mandolin that I worked on uh, was fairly V-shaped. And so that's where we're headed with this.
Alright, <clears throat> that looks pretty good. Um, I, you know, I'm sure it's nowhere near final, but uh, we're going to turn it over and do the other side now. Anyway, it's not too bad right now. Um, it just needs, it just does need some more work. All right, off camera, what I've done is I've spent a lot of time working on this heel, getting it to as small as I could get it, I, and still uh, feel like I was going to be able to make the uh, lower standard size that I was trying to go for. And then what I did was I. I, I got this all squared up and straight and everything, real square and straight. And then I took those measurements in thousands of inches with the calipers and I transferred them to this. And you might be able to see that I've drawn the angle across there and the angle across there. And then basically this depth goes right back to the back here, except maybe just a, oh, I, I don't know, about 50 thousandths. And then we'll just, that this piece here will work itself out across the back. But you can see this is the part that has to be removed inside the lines. And so we're going to get started working on that. Once again, I'll let you look from the back side of the saw. Uh, this, uh, again, I'm cutting a little bit blind. Uh, this uh, jig I have this setting on holds it at pretty close to the right angle. Uh, That's what she looks like, and uh, it should work real good. Now we can just chip that out of there, and uh, the neck should, you know, come close to fitting. All right, so now we've got this uh, notched out. We can just break this off and uh, start taking this out of here. Okay, and then we just start carving it off to match. All right, so that's that's just roughed out. Let's just see how far off we are. Yeah, yeah, I knew we would have quite a bit to go, and we do. Um, you might be able to see that it's a long way from going all the way down in there. And uh, that's perfectly okay. I'd rather have it uh, where we sneak up on it rather than be right there. That way we can make the joint real tight as we work on it. Not too bad as far as straightness goes. It's pretty close, but we're going to have to start uh, working on uh, putting some carbon paper in there and seeing where the high spots are and working those high spots off. And then that's how I get it to make a really tight, straight fit. I just put the carbon paper in there and maybe you can see the dark spots where it's hitting. And so those, that's the easy way to do it, and then just carve those dark spots away. And then you just, you just do that over and over. And uh, eventually you'll have more and more dark spots because it'll be hitting in more and more places. But uh, right now it's only hitting in a few places. I turned the carbon paper over both ways that time uh, in case there's some real high spots on the neck itself, I can scrape those off. Well, it's getting pretty close. It's been a long day. I'm going to give it a rest overnight and finish this tomorrow when I'm fresh. It's the next morning and uh, I've got about 30 minutes before I have to leave and I thought I'd use that 30 minutes to uh, 
work on the neck a little bit. Uh, we're getting ready to leave to go play a show at an elementary school near here. And uh, I take uh, a couple of guys with me and we play music for the kids. And we also uh, show them arrowheads and things that are found here on the farm. And they really get a kick out of all that. You can see that the color on the here is pretty smooth, it's, which indicates that it's making pretty good contact all the way down. Boy, it's, it's really a pretty good joint. It's, it's amazing how you can just slip it in there and it will hold. Another day has passed. Uh, we played our show for the kids yesterday and I never did get back in here because I worked on my whole 57 dump truck. Trying to figure out a fuel problem on that without any success. But uh, anyway, the uh, joint here that we're working on is very, very, very complex. There, it's it's uh, complex in so many ways. First of all, you want it straight all the way down to the tail. You want a straight line right down the center of the mantle and top, down the center of the neck. So that's, that's the easy way. You also have to get this angle correct. Uh, in other words, the angle to the neck uh, from the, and you have to get the tilt correct this way. So there's a, a bunch going on here. And um, then the last thing, and, it, and it's partly with this angle, is that, you know, I've got this jig made up with this little saddle sitting here so that when the neck is laying flat on here, and the top is sitting on this, it's at the correct angle. Well, all that has to be carved right into here. And I've just about got what I would think is perfection on this because I've got it right on the spot, all my marks, and then when I press down on this, it doesn't lift up here. It's absolutely tight. I've got the joint tight here. Um, it's almost perfectly level here. I've got like less than a 64th of an inch to go. That's what I'm working on, is trying to get it down that last little tiny bit, keep everything else good and straight. I'm happy with the angle, the straight straightness of the neck now, down through there. <coughs> I'm happy with the angle here. Now I'm going to look at the tilt and make sure it looks flat. I, it almost has to be the way I built this, but uh, I just want to double check the tilt. And what I do is I lay a flat something flat across here and I check the edges of the mandolin. It looks real good and flat. It doesn't look canted at all. Just gonna work on shaving ever so slightly more out of it just to get it to that last little, like I said, less than a 64th of an inch. Just, just hardly any at all. And uh, so I'll put my carbon paper back in here and see if I can see any highs. And, uh, yeah, I do see a couple highs here. And now I'll just scrape off uh, the color that got on here from the other side of the uh, carbon paper. And between the two, we ought to be good. I would... Yep, it feels real smooth. Wow, it feels real good. Making sure that it's no gap, no gap. That's real good. That's, we'll just set the back on here and see if I see any gap. It should look, yep, I think it's good and tight now. That's, that's a good fit there. Now we'll double check the fit here. Assuming that that's good, we're good to go. We're ready to glue it in there. Yep, I think we're ready to glue her in there. Looks pretty straight, so we're gonna we're gonna call that good. Next step is glue her in place. Okay, you can see I've got her clamped in there, and uh, just checking straightness again. You just can't be too careful with this kind of thing. Looks perfect. Looks just absolutely on the money. The height here is great, so. I'd say we're really good to go there. Um, we're going to let that set up for a little while and then we'll put the two dowel pins in here that will lock it in place down that joint 
and it cannot come apart. The mandolin has been sitting drying for over 24 hours and I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to drill and I'm going to drill at the same angle as the neck is because I'm trying to stay on the seam between between this block and the neck. It's just a lock to lock the neck to the block and it can't come loose that way when you split the difference there. Anytime you're going to fit a dowel in a hole that's going to be a tight fit, what I do is I take and put a line up the side of the dowel and then I cut that line and it gives an air release and a place for the glue to squeeze out. So we just cut a little slot in it like so. And the only other thing I'm going to do, and I could do this on the grinder easier, but I could cut a little tiny bevel in the tip of this because the drill bit is beveled on the tip. And uh, it'll just let the dowel go in a little bit deeper that way. And it goes in a little easier too, just because you're not hitting the sides. What I like to do on this, instead of squirting the whole hole full of glue, I prefer paint the glue down in the hole and the reason is because it, it again it, it doesn't create such a vacuum so you put a little glue on there and then you just kind of work it around the hole and then I really should have cut this dowel off before I did all this I wasn't really thinking this all through on camera here I'll just cut it a little extra long Okay, so I've cut the dowel a little extra long and I'll drive it into the hole there now. Now we'll wipe off the excess glue and saw it flush. That's about it. So it almost went flush, but not quite. And they're perfectly flush. And uh, we're ready to move on to the next step. Another tradition that I've done on my mandolins is just before I close them up, I sign the head block in here. And so I'm going to attempt to do that right now. I uh, Generally sign them with a ballpoint pen, which is probably very non-traditional, but uh, it's just what I do. So here we go. I will try to write my name in here. It's very awkward and it doesn't come out very nice, but at least I'll have it in there. And I put the date. So we have it in there. Don't know if you can see that. <laughs> the, the light might be blinding it out. There we go. But anyway, there we, you can see it is in there, Jerry L. Rose Sr. Today is October 20th, 2017. And that way, if the label ever comes out, at least someone will have some idea what's going on. So now, uh, we're just about ready to fit up the back and go ahead and glue it down. What I would like to do first, though, is I'm going to put a few temporary clamps on here, and then I'm going to mark this heel and try to cut the heel so that uh, it won't take so much uh, work after we get the back glued on. And before I shape the heel of the back, I want to shape the neck heel itself and make sure that I'm happy with it. I think I've got it uh, temporarily clamped well enough that I can mark it and uh, you won't be able to see what I'm marking exactly probably but uh, anyway I'm just marking right around the heel. The pencil marks revealed kind of a lack of symmetry here so I'm just going to make it a little more symmetrical. Okay, so we'll go ahead and cut this loose and see what it looks like. I go for good coverage, but not 
crazy thick coverage. Just good solid coverage but uh, not so thick that we get a ton of squeeze out because we don't really want much squeeze out on the inside of the instrument. You can't get in there to clean it out for one thing. Well, that ought to do it. It's uh, clamped up really nice, and we'll give that a full day to just rest. As you can see, the mandolin is out of the clamps. We now have at least a completed body and neck, and uh, so that's the state of the mandolin at the moment. Be kind of a close-up look there, just of how it looks. There's the rose and carved in there. And so that's how she sets. Now, <clears throat> I know some of you will think I'm exaggerating, but I promise you I'm not. It takes just as long to go from here to the finished product as it did to get to here. And <clears throat> if I'm not overstating it, I'd say it actually takes longer. So this, in my opinion, is really where the work starts. Um, I call this the ugly duckling stage. I mean, it's just kind of a, you know, it's got a lot of potential, but it is an ugly duckling right now. You know, all the sound is there already that it's going to get, <laughs> if you will. So from this point forward, it's the beautification stage, and we just try to make it as beautiful and pretty of a mandolin as we can make it. You know, none of that will affect the sound, so we just go forward and do the best we can from here. Hope you enjoyed it up to this point. I hope you'll click the like button, and I hope you uh, will subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and uh, tell your friends about the channel. Thank you very much for watching. Yeah.